New topic today, having to do with wear and surface fatigue. So we're kind of jumping back to theory after having looked at some practice with respect to shafts. And this is to set you up for bearing design and, that, and gear design and that sort of thing. So the experts somewhat disagree on what all the possible categories are, but the majority of them agree on these five. Now, I don't profess to be an expert on wear, by the way. That's a totally different field than my, f my major focus, but I do know a fair bit about it. So we have these five categories, adhesive, abrasive, erosion, corrosion, and surface fatigue. And I'm going to talk to each of one of those in more or less detail as we go through the lecture. So let's start with a discussion of surface finish. Now, depending upon the way I manufacture a part, I can get quite large differences in the character of the surface of the metal. And I'm talking pretty much about metals here, although you can extrapolate these principles to other materials. But most engineering parts are made of metal, certainly those that have high stresses. So what you're looking at here are photomicrographs made in my laboratory here at WPI of cam surfaces. And the one on the left was done by grinding, and the one on the right was done by milling. And if you're not familiar with those terms, which you should be if you've taken any manufacturing courses, milling is a cutting process whereby a sharp tool that's harder than the material is used to literally tear away the material. And the materials in this instance are typically ductile. And when you look at that surface with the naked eye, it looks pretty good, but take out a microscope. This is 100x. And you begin to see some distinct characteristics on the surface on the right. I see what look like little mountains and valleys and scuff lines and so on. And the the, uh, the reason for those is that with a ductile material, think taffy, when you, when you cut it apart, you're actually tearing at the surface. And you're literally ripping it apart. And some bits and pieces will be pulled up into mountains, and others will, be, will leave behind little valleys, and the surface will be relatively rough. Now, this, the track you see below is a measurement of the roughness of that surface done with a very fancy machine called a profilometer. And uh, this was done uh, probably 25 years ago. Profilometers now are often lasers that don't even touch the surface. But this is a contact profilometer. It has a diamond stylus. If any of you are into hi-fi and still use records, it's much like a a cartridge that's used to track a record groove. And it has a radius on the tip of the diamond of about a micron. So that actually serves as a filter, because it can't detect anything smaller than that radius. So you'll never, you'll never see anything smaller than that. And that's very slowly dragged across the surface. Not very far. That whole track is 2 and a half millimeters, which is adjustable on, the, on this machine. And it takes 8,000 data points in 2.5 millimeters. So it's a pretty fine measurement. And that stylus, much like your record cartridge, is uh, spring-loaded with a very light spring. So it's just riding over the surface. And it, the ups and down motions are being captured electrically and displayed here. And you look at the one on the left, which is the ground surface, and you see a very distinct difference. First of all, the mountains and valleys are nowhere near as big. And secondly, well, they're not as rough-shaped, if I can use that terminology, rather uh, unscientific term. But I see very sharp peaks on the, on the right, and I see kind of rounded things on the left. So clearly, I'm getting a better surface finish out of grinding than I am out of milling. And that's one of the reasons you do grind things, is to get the surface finish better and to get the dimensions more accurate as well. Grinding is not an expensive process. It will typically double the cost of a part. You have to first mill it to get the approximate shape. 
If you intend to grind it, you will leave a little extra on it so you can trim that off to the final dimension. And particularly if the part's going to be hardened, which is typical of a cam or a gear, then after milling it to shape, you will heat treat it. And as you know, when you heat treat it, you heat the metal to very high temperatures, and that causes distortion, particularly if the part has an odd shape. And that distortion may remain in the part after it's cooled. And thus, I have changed the physical contour of the part. So the grinding is used to, to correct the contour and bring it to a tighter tolerance and also to improve the surface finish. And it requires a specialized machine, and it requires approximately the same amount of time in the machine as the original milling did, that thus the doubling of the cost. Now, the, the values you see on those plots are measured in micrometers or microns. And on the left, we see a, you probably can't read those numbers, they're so small, but there's a cascade of numbers over here, all of which have little codes, and I think that's probably going to come up on the next slide. And the numbers look like they range from one and a quarter microns for the largest, if I'm reading the letters correctly, the largest peak-to-peak -peak excursions, a little over a micron, and the average is about a half a micron over there. And over here, the peak-to-peak -peak is about four and a half microns, and the average is about two. That's quite a difference. So these are, these are actually just textbook pictures of the various parameters that are calculated from this measurement. So you make this measurement with a very fancy and expensive kit that's going to take my 8,000 data points or whatever over the, the test length. And then you essentially do some statistics on that. And so the most common parameter you will see, and they're all given the capital letter R to stand for roughness, and then a subscript. This is depicting RA, which is the one you will most commonly encounter. And it is nothing more than the average of the absolute values of all the numbers that were measured. Okay? So just flip them all to positive, add them up, and divide by n. The second one I'm going to show you, I think, is going to be RQ. And it's showing you a different picture of a surface, which is not relevant to what we're looking at. But RQ is very similar to RA statistically because it is the root mean square average. So instead of forcing everything to positive, you square everything, which of course makes them all positive, and then you take the square root and divide by n. And those numbers will usually be very close to one another, not exactly the same because the squaring has done something to the data. So, but they will be similar. And they mean similar things. They are the average roughness. Okay. RPM, P stands for peak, M for mean. It says here it's the arithmetic average of the five single highest peaks above the mean line. So this is giving me a more uh, fine distinction about peak height. They're not, looking, not averaging everything, but just the five biggest guys. Okay? So that'll be a very different number than either of the other two. Waviness is the long term a low frequency change in the surface. Now, that has a W code, which stands for waviness. And the difference here is that in the uh, mathematical calculation process on the data, the slow changing undulations in the surface are essentially removed mathematically for the roughness calculation. So you can think of it as having a very low frequency carrier wave, I'm speaking in electrical terms now, on which is riding a high frequency information wave. Okay? And so in the case of the R values, we're looking at just the information being carried on the carrier. This is the way radio works, by the way. The low frequency carrier wave has sitting on it these oscillations, which are the, the uh, sound that you're going to hear from the broadcast. So now, this is the inverse of that. Here, the low frequency has been kept and the high frequency discarded. So that tells me a different story about the surface. Essentially, how flat is it? How much is it, is, is it varying in a gross sense 
over its dimension. Okay? So that's a very different kind of information. The last one I'm going to show you, and there are 19 of these parameters, by the way, defined by ISO. Uh, and that was the last time I looked, which was 25 years ago. They probably have added another 10 to that by now, for all I know. This is skewness, which is the average of the first derivative of my measurement. And there's actually something called kurtosis, which is the average of the second derivative. And this tells me a lot more about the surface characteristics. Because if the, if the value of this so-called skewness turns out to be negative, which it can, and this one does happen to have a negative value, what that tells me is I have a preponderance of valleys as opposed to mountaintops. So the character of the surface is such that it is somewhat truncated in a positive direction and not in a negative direction. And its positive skewness is exactly the reverse. So it has more mountains than valleys. Okay. In general, grinding will give me a negative skewness because the grinding process is knocking off the mountaintops and leaving the valleys. Whereas a milling process will give me a positive skewness because, like taffy, it's pulling these up as it tears the, tears the metal apart if the metal is ductile. So here I show you two pictures taken from one of those traces in which I have purportedly calculated the RA and the RQ. And I'm calling them the same value. I don't have numbers on them anyway, so it doesn't matter. And I've taken one picture and flipped it upside down to make the second picture. And as you might imagine, if I take the absolute value of every value and, and average them, I'm going to get the same number, whether it's right side up or upside down. And the same would be true if I squared them all, because I force them all positive. So the, piece on the surface on the left has the same RA and the same RQ as the one on the right. So that tells me that that parameter doesn't tell me a hell of a lot about the surface. Now, if I'm designing a, uh, making a piston to run in a cylinder wall in an engine, I would very much like that to have both pieces to have negative skewness. Because as, as the piston goes up and down, I don't want it to have to knock off mountaintops on the way back and forth. That's going to do some nasty things to it. Uh, the valleys, I don't give a hoot about. In fact, they help me because they trap the oil. So I want a negative skewness where I have two things rubbing against one another. That would be like I see on the, on the left. Um, so uh, it never ceases to amaze me when I look at drawings of parts for machines in almost every industry except aircraft and automotive. And with those two exceptions, you often see a drawing with nothing on it but RA. And you t pick up a drawing for a piston or a, or a cylinder from an automotive company, and they will have six or seven of these specified. The waviness, the skewness, the RP, the RPM, the RA. Because they know what they're doing with respect to the surface business. So when I see a drawing with just an RA on it, I say, whoever did that drawing doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Because that tells me nothing, except that I want an average value of roughness, which could be positive skewness, negative skewness, or whatever. And those, <laughs> those have very, very different results in the way the part functions. OK, different topic slightly here. Still talking about the surface characteristics, but not so much in terms of their measurement. Here we're talking about something called uh, real area of contact, dubbed A sub R, as opposed to apparent area of contact, dubbed A sub A. Apparent area of contact is trivial to figure out. I, t I have a book. It's that big. The area is whatever that area is sitting on the table. That's the apparent area of contact with the table. The real area of contact, however, depends upon uh, other factors. And it will always be much lower than the apparent area. So what I show here is a, a symbolic or schematic view of two surfaces that have some what are called asperities, meaning there's humps and bumps. If you magnify it enough, you'll see them. Okay, so I've exaggerated that at this at this scale. 
And when I first put those two things together, it's perfectly commonsensical. They're only going to touch at the tops of the mountains, at the heights, at the tips of the asperities, right? And so now I start to put some load on that, and I, I force them together. Now, let's assume for the sake of discussion that initially, with no load on it, it's sitting mountaintop to mountaintop, and very, very little deformation of those mountaintops has occurred, right? But if I really have zero area at those mountaintops, that's unsustainable because that would give me infinite stress, right? So it has to happen that the mountaintops get crushed, even when I first put the two parts together. And they crush to the degree that the now real area of contact becomes sufficient to sustain the part against its strength, its yield strength. And so you can, you can show that. These are all approximate equations. You see the squiggle over the equal sign. That where this is declared that SP is called the penetration strength, and the force applied between the two parts divided by the penetration strength gives you the area, a sub r, the real area of contact. But it turns out that this penetration strength is approximately three times the yield in compression for a given material or pair of materials. So what does that say? It says no matter what the physical size of my part is, when I put it in a, say they're both made of steel, so I know what the yield strength is in both cases, when I put them together and put a certain load on them, I can predict what the area of contact is, the real area of contact, with that simple formula. It can be forced divided by three times the, the yield strength. You remember in Physics 101 when they told you, or this is, you might have heard this in high school for that matter, high school physics, I'm certain you did. And they said, Coulomb friction, dry friction between two parts, is independent of surface area. Did that bother you? It always bothered me. I said, how could that be? You know, I take a, a little thing, and I put it on the table and go to slide it, I'd expect that to have a little force. It'd take a big thing, I'd expect it to have a bigger force. But you could, do, you could test it till the cows come home, and it has the same force independent of the apparent area of contact. Why? Because they both have the same real area of contact if they're both made of the same material. That's why Coulomb friction is independent of area. Makes perfect sense when you understand this concept. It's just normal force divided by, or rather, times the uh, coefficient of friction, right? And the coefficient of friction turns out to be easily testable, first of all, and typically numbers between about 0.2 and 0.5. And I had, don't have a slide on it here, but I think the next section in the book after where I show that picture, I have a description of how the, uh, the friction is calculated based on these parameters. And it shows that, uh, with some sim simplifying assumptions, that the theoretical coefficient of friction between any two materials is roughly, for metals, about 0.2 to 0.5. And that's where the test data shows up. So I think the whole issue has been put to bed with this. That's why friction is in Coulomb friction is independent of area, apparent area. Okay. Adhesive wear, I think, was the first flavor of wear on the list. And what is meant by that, just what the word adhesion means, it's stick stuff sticking to stuff, right? So if I take two metal surfaces that are compatible, now what do they mean by compatible? By compatible in this context is meant that they love one another. They make a good pair. Uh, they easily dissolve in one another. You can make al an alloy out of the two of them, okay. et cetera. Incompatible materials hate one another, and you can't get them together for anything. Now, that, from an engineering standpoint, I would think of the second category, which I just described as incompatible, as being quite compatible to run on one another because they're not going to screw up, right? Whereas what the material, what the uh, tribologist is the guy that does this stuff. 
fibrolysis says is that uh, compatible metals are those that like one another and will stick very well. So if I have the same material on the same material, clearly they're compatible. So extreme example, if I take two pieces of aluminum and I spend a little bit of effort polishing the surfaces with some emery paper to make them nice and clean, get rid of the aluminum oxide, which is incompatible <laughs> with aluminum, even though it's on there, right? And I get them nice and clean, and I quickly stick them together and push them like this, very hard, lots of force between them and slide them, take them, take them in one hand, and they're stuck together. They've galled. They've cold welded because the materials are compatible. They're the same. Adhesion is, adhesive wear is the process of two such metals partially welding themselves together. So the pieces of one get transferred to the other. Okay. So it's also, as I say here, called scoring, scuffing, or galling. And we can reduce it by only putting incompatible materials together, ones that don't like one another from a chemical standpoint. And we can also screw it up in terms of the compatible materials by filling the gap with lubricants so they never really get to touch one another. So if there's a film of oil in there, then they never know one another is there. They see oil only. And then I can save it. Very common form of wear. It usually indicates bad lubrication or a poor choice of materials. Second category is called abrasive wear. Again, the name is very descriptive. It's quite obvious what's going on. I've got some abrasive taking away material. Now, there are, there are two subcategories of abrasive wear called two-body and three-body. Two-body, an example of that would be I take a piece of steel, I stick it in the vise, I go pull out a file out of the drawer, and I go at it with a file. And the file being harder than the other piece of steel and sharp starts to remove material and I'm abrading away the material with two bodies, my file and the piece in question. Three body, I got some sand in there or some other, some rocks or something. And I'm, you know, these two are running around together in the rocks and the sand and the third body, namely the rockets, rocks and the sand are abrading it away. This is an example of that second category. It's the tooth of a backhoe. I don't know what a backhoe is. It digs holes in the ground. On the left, leftmost panel shows the brand new backhoe tooth. The middle panel shows the back side of the tooth, same side as you're looking at in the first picture, after it's dug a bunch of holes and played in the dirt. And so now a whole bunch of metal has been removed. And it happens that the back side of that, which that's a replaceable part that goes over the the tine of the, of the backhoe. So you don't have to replace the whole bloody backhoe when you wear out the tine. You just replace the sleeve. And that's soft steel, ductile steel. And this is the front side after a lot of use. But that's made of very hard steel, more expensive, of course. But that's what's really taken the beating, because that's doing the digging. And you'll see that it's, it's been actually worn quite smooth. It looks a bit like a ground part as opposed to a milled part. Both have really been ground by braces. So here's a chart of abrasion resistant materials which is out of a famous uh, materials book by Rabinowitz. He was a professor at MIT and one of my contemporaries was his student many years ago and he told me that they called him Mr. Ware or Dr. Ware because he was the Ware expert. Uh, he's all worn out now. He's gone. So at the top of the list, this is relative wear on a scale of uh, 1 to 100, or half, or point or 0 to 100, or whatever. So tungsten carbide is just about the hardest, save diamond, which is too bloody expensive to do anything with except make rings out of, uh, is uh, mm -hmm. tungsten carbide is a material that can only be made by sintering. Uh, it's a really a ceramic, um, and it's it's got a rating of about uh, 0.5 to 5 on the relative wear scale. The hardness number has units. It's kilograms per square millimeter. Uh, 
And you can see that's quite a high number. And you go down the list, the next highest is cr high chromium white cast iron. White cast iron's not good for much because it's brittle as all Dickens. It's br more brittle than gray cast iron, but it's harder than the Dickens. And this is its one claim to fame. So it's used in things like backhoe teeth and whatnot where you, it's subjected to a, a really serious wear issue. Uh, it's very, very hard. Tool steel is high carbon steel that I can harden the, the Dickens out of. And that's 20 to 30, and so are most of the other um, common uh, metals. Carburized steel, of course, is just lower carbon steel that's been hardened. Nitrided steel, likewise, is, that's a form of hardening. Prolytic white iron, I'm not sure why that's a little bit so much less than the other guy, uh, but it is. Um, manganese steel, another prolytic alloy steel, et cetera, et cetera. And here's, uh, as a reference, as rolled a normalized low carbon, in other words, not hardened steel, that's the 100 on the scale. So that's a very high wear material, just as a reference. So if that kind of wear is your concern, you go to a material chart like that and pick something suitable. Corrosion wear is another animal altogether. Again, these names are very descriptive. So if I put my piece of metal in a corrosive environment, which might be salt water, or it might be an acid, or it might be some other nasty chemical that is going to eat away at the material, that's going to give me corrosive wear. And just sticking the part in the corrosion material, or corrosive material, I should say, is enough to do damage to it. But it gets much worse, much faster, if I also apply stress to the part in any fashion, rub the parts, you know, rub two parts together while they're in this salt water or whatever. Um, because what happens then is the rubbing together strips the oxide that's virtually immediately formed is when I put it into the medium. And it, it then uh, provides fresh fodder. You know, I got now some nice clean steel of, available for the corrosive environment to keep eating. So uh, rather than slow down the process by having a whole bunch of corrosive products in the way, I'm getting rid of them and making it happen faster. Second paragraph talks about some reaction products that come about from having stuck the steel into some horrible chemical or other, such as metallic chlorides, phosphates, and sulfides, are actually softer than the metal substrate. Uh, whereas others are brittle and hard. And those can act actually f as beneficial contaminants to reduce abrasive wear and adhesive wear, particularly adhesive wear, by blocking the adhesion of the metal asperity. So this is acting like another form of oil, if you will. And I'm putting a protective coating because I'm leaving behind these products of corrosion. And they happen to be softer than the steel, so they're not going to do abrasion on it. And they tend to protect it because it, now the stuff, the base metal is not as exposed to the nasty environment. And this is done deliberately in oils that you use in your automobile and many other instances. They're called EP, for, it stands for Extreme Pressure Lubricants, and they are oils, typically mineral oil that to which have been added compounds such as, do I list them here? S sulfides, chlorides, phosphates, uh, even soap is used because soap contains some of these things. And this is the oil you put in the differential of your car and sometimes in the transmission if it's a standard transmission because there's so much sliding wear going on in those gears that they need some protection from the uh, effects of uh, adhesion, <laughs> and the oils are doing that for you. So in essence, what you're doing is you're trading a slow rate of corrosive deterioration for what would have been a faster rate of adhesive deterioration uh, without these protective compounds. And this is common with gear teeth and cams that have poor conforming geometry. Uh, this little animal is quite intriguing, and no one has yet put forth 
a theory that everyone can agree with as to how this happens. It's a very mysterious process. It it's happens out of your sight, for one thing. And where you see it occur, and I've seen it with my own eyes, you have a pin that's press fit into a hole in a machine. And the pin's got some loads on it or whatever. It's a pivot for something or other. And it's just, I don't want that pin to ever move. So I make the dimensions such that I can press it into the hole and forget about it. It should not be able to move in the hole at all. After the machine is run for some period of time, months, years, whatever, I walk by one day and I look down and I say, hmm, that's odd. All around that pin is some red stuff. And I take my finger and pick it up, and it's gritty. It's iron oxide. It's rust. And it's coming out of the interface between the pin and the machine. And there's probably some oil mixed with it because there's oil all over the place in the machine. So what I have is oily rust, which is abrasive as all get out because iron oxide is a ceramic. It's harder than steel by a long shot. And it's forming in the interface of the press fit. And the mystery is no one knows quite what makes it form. The, the most popular theory that I've heard, yes, sir, go ahead. You're right on the money. So um, who knows how the corrosion starts? You know, they, they put oil on it. When they put it together, it shouldn't have any water. So gradually, it starts to rust in the interface. And that's what's showing up out the crack. And eventually, that's a picture of one that has gone quite a, quite a ways to failure. Probably fell out of the hole uh, or loosened so much that it had to be taken apart. There was a lock nut on it here. But those darkened areas are actually missing material that's rusted away. Finally, we get to surface fatigue, and I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture on this topic. Whenever I have parts that are rolling together, we're talking about ball bearings, uh, gear teeth, cams and roller followers, and things of that nature, we get some very, very high stresses because the contact areas are quite small because you have you know, a roller running against a cam, it's probably line contact or possibly even point contact. Same with gear teeth. And if I run them long enough, eventually they will start to fail by what's called surface fatigue. And the first evidence of that is, as you see on the left, the formation of pits. And if left untended, and the, the pits will grow and grow and grow till they look like the thing on the right. This says pitted. It sure is. This says spalled, which is just a name for really a lot of pitting. And the, re the top one is disintegrated. Okay? So material is being essentially thrown away. Now, the mechanism that's going on here is quite complex and quite interesting. And it was first uh, figured out by a guy named Hertz. And you've run across his name before. So it's called Hertzian stress. And this is a couple of centuries ago. Hertz discovered that materials that are in contact have normal stresses only, uh, normal applied stresses. There will, of course, always be induced shear. Think of the more diagram. But they have normal applied stresses. They are three-dimensional. This is one of the few true three-dimensional stress states that we encounter in machine design. And the stress directions will be normal to and orthogonal with the tangent plane of contact. Fancy way of saying directly into the material, and x and y in the tangent plane where the two touch. Okay, And those three stresses, column x, y, and z, will also be principal. So they're both x, y, and z, and also 1, 2, and 3. And there are three cases of interest. The first is the general case where I have any shape in any shape. You know, football against basketball or whatever, some you know, weirdo shapes. Special cases within that are cylindrical contact, very common. I've got a roller running against another roller. That would be cylindrical contact. Or rolling against a plane, same thing. And spherical uh, contact, very common, ball on ball, a ball on, on flat plane, a ball on circumferential plane, or whatever. So this is ball bearings, cylindrical bearings, and this is everything else. Okay. They say the second two are special cases of the first. 
So whenever I put two things together and put enough load on them to, to uh, deflect them, I create what's called a contact patch between them. And you've seen this. Uh, if you've ever moved your car after a, a spring shower and looked back, you will see four little dry patches on the ground where your tires were sitting. And they are roughly ovoid because the tire, and you can see this when you look at the tire, it's flat on the bottom because the load of the car on the wheel has compressed the air in the tire and the rubber in the, in the uh, casing until it developed enough area of contact to support the load, right? That's my contact patch. That's true no matter what the materials or what the loads. So now picture two ball bearings or a ball bearing running against a race, which is, I can show two ball bearings here, I guess, two spheres of cylinders. And now these are hardened steel, typically. So they're stiff as a boot. They're not a tire. But they still have a contact patch. Very small contact patch, but nevertheless a contact patch. Why? If I have zero area in there, what the hell's the stress? F over A is infinity. Can't do it. I can't support anything with zero area of contact. So the area of contact is going to increase elastically. I'm going to elastically deflect the parts until they develop enough area to, to fight back and hold the load. Right? But now start turning the bearing. And as the bearing turns, the patch moves. Right? So every point on that bearing comes through the patch once per revolution. And I now have dynamic loading. Load, nothing, load, nothing, load, nothing, load, nothing. All these stresses are compressive. And we've talked before about fatigue being largely a tensile stress phenomenon. Pitting is a fatigue type failure. It's called surface fatigue. So that's a puzzlement. How, how can compressive stress cause fatigue failure when I've already told you that compressive stress is the machine designer's friend. And that's true in almost all cases, but this ain't one of them. This is the exception. Because what's really happening below the surface is I'm developing shear stress. Think of the Moore's circle. So th this shows you the other two cases. Here's the generic case, you know, football on football or whatever. And I've got some ellipsoidal type contact patch, which in the third dimension also looks ellipsoidal. So it's like half a football. And the contact area is defined by the uh, major and minor axes of the ellipse. And it's always done as the half width. So A and B are the half widths of the ellipse, major and minor. Here you have a cylindrical contact. And this gives me a rectangular um, patch. And again, the half width of that rectangle is called A. That's my, how I define the contact patch. So I'm not going to go through these equations in detail. I'll leave that to you to study in the book. But let me point out what's in them. It's not much. Uh, sigma z, and the, by the way, the directions are always z is in and out of the material. x and y are you know, in the plane of the contact. Take your pick as to which way x and y are. So z is the major interest here. Because as I go into the material, you would expect the stress would decrease, right? Because I've got more, I'm further away from the load. The load's at the surface. So this says that the sigma in the z direction is equal to the maximum pressure. That's just the pressure you're exerting on the joint uh, times minus 1 plus z cubed. Z is the distance into the surface, below the surface, I should say, into the part that I wish to measure the stress. Uh, and A, of course, is my half patch width. And z is the same thing again, and then very nonlinear. And the sigma x and sigma y, a uh, bit messier equations, but there's not that much else in here. We've got p max over 2 now. v is Poisson's ratio because my load is in the z direction. So the effects in x and y can only be delivered by Poisson, right? Because when I smush something this way, it beer barrels. And a beer barrel is in the ratio that Poisson defined for that phenomenon, which we give his name to. If you stretch it, it, it uh, hourglasses. If you compress it, it beer barrels. <laughs>
But below the surface, let me bring the plots up here. Here I've got a sigma z, a sigma x, and a sigma y. And if I do the, essentially the, the Moore circle don't work very well in 3D, but if I do the, you know, the, all the calculations associated with them, with the cubic polynomial and all that stuff, I can, I can calculate and plot T13, which is the maximum shear stress. And look at this. It's biggest below the surface where the pit starts. So I've got a high stress and shear <coughs> in the material. And if there's a little flaw anywhere in that material, that shear stress is going to find it. And it's going to grow that crack and grow that crack and grow that crack until boop, out pops a divot. And now I've got a rough surface. So every time that, that pit comes through, it goes bang, and the thing grows like crazy. Now, the, the only good news in this is that this is a failure that is not as sudden as a typical fatigue failure, where suddenly the wing falls off the aircraft or the bridge collapses. This gives you lots of warning. And I'm sure you've all heard this, because you all drive a car. You probably own a car. And at some point in the car's life, the bearings start to wear out in the wheels. And you're driving along, and you can't quite hear the radio, so you turn it up because there's some noise. And you ignore the noise, and you turn up the radio. But the noise keeps getting louder and louder, and the noise is like a rumbling. <laughs> and the, if you drive faster, it goes, and drive slow, it goes because it's the speed of the wheels turning, you see? And you've now got pitted bearings, and they're going bangity, bangity, bang as they come around. And that just keeps getting worse and worse until you can't turn the radio up anymore, and then you've got to fix it. <laughs> and if you don't fix it, eventually it's going to look like that disintegrated version of the gear tube I gave you. <coughs> and in some cases, depending on the design of the car, the bloody wheel can fall off at that point. So you know, when you can't hear the radio anymore, it's time to take it to the mechanic and get the bearing fixed. But I usually wait until that point. <laughs> <laughs> until I just can't stand it anymore. I drove my truck all the way to Florida and back and with it getting louder and louder. And I said, oh, God. I'm going to wait till I get home and take it to my friendly mechanic. And that took six months. I finally got so I couldn't stand anywhere and fix it. But anyway, this is a um, photoelastic study. I described photoelasticity to you before. I showed you some examples. This was done here at WPI. We used to have a terrific photoelectricity lab right outside this room. Professor Tom Hammond, who was, uh, when I first arrived here, was like my current age. He was a very, very senior faculty, and uh, he had this nice photoelectricity lab, and some of his grad students made this picture. This is a cam made of Lexan and a roller, and these are the stress isobars, and the maximum stress is right there. That's that shear stress beneath the surface. It's going to go boop, make a pit. Now, this, what I've talked to you about and shown you so far assumes uh, static loading. And Mr. Hertz, back two centuries ago, only concerned himself with static loading. They probably didn't have very much in the way of dynamic loading back then. You know, there weren't very many machines around that could go fast. Whatever reason. Uh, and he died before he could take up anything else. So we only have static equations. So what happens is, the question is, what happens when we introduce dynamics, which of course is always the situation with our bearings and whatnot, and w very messy equations, as you can see. And you'll have to study the text in which I derive these based on uh, the literature. Let me just show you the pictures. Those are much more valuable than, than words. So on the left, you see more or less the same picture I just showed you, static loading. Dynamic loading distorts the field because I'm now introducing some shear stress on the surface. And that changes the whole game. Now, instead of the shear stress being maximum below the surface, it brings it up to the surface. And this is a whole bunch of plots that I generated with those equations that show what happens when I, not only am I making things roll past one another, but I've got a sliding uh, component in here. I've got a tangential load superposed on top of the vertical load. And I, 
I liken this, my analogy is very simple. Imagine you have a big, heavy cardboard carton of something or other, and it's on a loose rug. It's not wall to wall carpeting, it's just a carpet. And I'm trying to move that box across the room. I start to slide it, and of course, it's got really high coefficient of friction to the carpet. What happens? You bunch the carpet up in front of the box and stretch the carpet behind the box. And that's what's happening here. So the tensile stress is the stretching behind the box. And the compression is the piling up of the carpet in front of the box. And, and counterintuitively, this looks like the, the uh, piling up because it's going up. But that's tensile stress. And negative is compressive stress. So this is the backside getting stretched. And this is the compressive stress getting built up. And notice the skewing in the compressive regime toward the direction of motion, because I'm bunching the carpet up, in, a, in essence, in front of me, right? So it's more or less the same thing, but all the things are distorted. The shapes are changed. And when I do the plots looking into the part, I now have a maximum stress in tau at the surface. But it doesn't drop very much for quite a ways into the surface. This is all normalized. This is the depth of z divided by a. Everything is normalized in these pictures, so they're applicable to any size part. And sigma 1, 2, and 3, are, as you see. Now, for years, during my career, there's been controversy and arguments among the professionals and the experts in papers and whatnot over what, what causes pitting. Is it where does the stress start? Do the stresses start below the surface or on the surface? And as I recall, there were two camps. There were those over here yelling, it's on the surface, on the surface. Over here, they said, no, no, it's below the surface. And they were arguing with one another for a long time. I think this slide puts the whole thing to bed. That's a very nice micrograph at about 100x or so of a, a, a part starting to fail. It's a cross section. The part's been sliced. So you can see down into it. Lo and behold, we see surface cracks forming up above. And we see this big subsurface crack there. So take your pick. And it doesn't really matter whether it starts at the surface or starts down below. If the pit comes out, it's all over but the shouting. And I really don't care an awful lot about where the pit started. I've got to deal with it one way or the other. Okay? Now, as you might expect, you'll have stress concentration wherever you go. And it's worth a look at how stress concentration affects contact elements. So here I show four different flavors of roller running against some other part. A straight roller, the most common, shows very large stress concentrations at the ends of the roller. Now you say, where's the notch? You've told us before, Professor Norton, that you always have high stresses at a notch. Where's the notch? Well, there isn't a physical notch here. There's a stress notch, if I can call it that, because suddenly the stress goes from something to nothing. And if you imagine that that material is being actually deflected down over the length of the roller, that's the notch, is the slight change in contour of the physical part, which is almost too small to see. If you use a crowned roller, it gets better. If you use a beer barrel roller, it's more or less the same as the crown roller. And then I came across a paper written a long time ago that proposed using a logarithmic curve on the roller. And they show and present plenty of equations to back it up that it gives me a stress concentration factor of 1.0. I like that. But until recently, I've never seen a logarithmic roller for sale. And it's always bugged me why some roller company didn't pick up on this. It's a slice better than sliced bread, you know. You can talk about competitive advantage. You got the only roller with no stress concentration? I wouldn't mind that as if I owned the company. Well, my, I've got an MQP students uh, group working on a very nice project that involves some cams and stuff. And I, I talked to them about this because they were having problems with the stress concentration. And by God, they found a company that makes them. <coughs> So somebody finally glommed onto this and started to make these rollers. So that's useful to know because you go from like three or four over here to one. That's a big help. I'm, I'm already pretty much out of time here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. But before I do, I want to bear with me now. Don't get, don't get anxious. I'll get you out of here before they 
the, uh, the swarm arrives as it did yesterday, if you were here. There's no knee in the curve for surface fatigue. That's the bad news. So unlike our bending situation, we have for steel at least, titanium, we have this nice flattening of the curve of the SN diagram. So if I stay below that, never going to fail. Don't have that advantage with the surface fatigue. Eventually, everything succumbs to this failure mechanism. So if I protect my parts against breakage, against all other possible nasty things that might happen to it, and I run it long enough, it's going to fatigue fail in the surface, if there is surface contact. It could, may not be in a given case. Wheel bearings in cars often last 100,000 miles. I calculated that at an average speed of 40, wheel race of such and so, that's 84 million rotations in 100,000 miles. Now, my truck has less than 30,000 miles on it, so I think I got ripped off by General Motors because I didn't get anywhere near 100,000 miles out of that wheel bearing, which cost, by the way, $600 for the part. Yes, sir. Doesn't come what? Doesn't come with a Oh, probably not. Probably not. Uh, in the good old days, all front wheel bearings were Timken tapered roller, which I haven't shown you bearings yet, but we'll talk about those when we get to it. And they come apart very easily. And so a standard maintenance procedure was every n thousand miles, twenty thousand miles, whatever. You had the mechanic take, oh, you did it yourself. It was easy to do. You, you took it apart, and you cleaned it off, and you re-greased it, and you put it back together, and you adjusted it. And those things last 100,000 miles. Not my truck. My truck has captive, multi-row ball bearings in this assembly with no, you got it, with, with no, no opportunity to re-lube, as you just said. And it's got lifetime lubrication built in. Not my lifetime. <laughs> Not the truck's lifetime. The bearings lifetime. <laughs> so that's where it's the.